Good morning, friends. The Lord be with you. It is a joy to be in worship with you this morning. Thank you for being present here in the sanctuary, and thank you to those who are joining us online. If you in the sanctuary would take the time to find the friendship pad and sign it, we would love to know you were here. And if you online would sign in on the virtual friendship pad, we'd be grateful to know you had joined us as well. As always, please be sure to look at the announcements and the bulletin, look at the e-news, the call, the website for all of the opportunities for Bible study, service, uh, ways, different ways to grow in your faith and the ministry of Christ. I wanted to just highlight for us some additional prayer requests. So if you could take out your prayer list in the bulletin, I'm going to add a little bit to that this morning. If you could remember Nora Cook, who had heart surgery, I'm sorry, back surgery on Tuesday, and she is still at the hospital recovering. There were uh, some complications. So pray for Nora and her family. B. McGill also has been in and out of the hospital and is currently in. So if you could remember to pray for B. Um, yesterday, John and Cindy Neal. Uh, found out that their 34-year-old niece uh, was discovered um, dead. She died. She, uh, they don't know why. They don't know what happened. Um, but they're just heartbroken. She was recently engaged. And uh, if you could keep the Neal family in your prayers, I know they would appreciate that. Also, uh, Teresa Lindemann's mother passed last week. Her name is Dorothy Frisbee. And that uh, funeral is in Ohio. Um, tomorrow. So if you could keep Teresa and uh, her family in your prayers. And finally, on the good news front, we're glad to see our brother Paul Cerny back here in worship after his uh, procedures and surgeries. And we are grateful that you are here with us, Paul. Thanks be to God for that. Good to see you. Yes, we're glad to be praying for you. Friends, let's take a moment to stand and greet one another. Uh, find somebody you haven't seen. Introduce yourself. Welcome them to worship. Share the peace of Christ.
Just as a reminder, after the opening prayer, if children want to go to Young Child and worship, they can meet down here as we sing the response and head out. Please join me in the call to worship as we turn our hearts to the Lord to say thank you and offer Him our praise. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn together. Please pray with me. God of ages, your people stand before you. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him? O Lord God of hosts, Who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you? Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Gather us now into your presence, Lord. Dwell and move within the hearts of your people here. By your grace, through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that covers us, may your Spirit guide us to truth. Awaken us to new life and fellowship with you now and through the journey on. Amen. Please be seated. Our call to confession today comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. 
For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. Almighty God, we acknowledge that turning from you is in our own arrogance and against your desire. While you remain faithful to us, we satisfy our own heart. Our words spread poison and our actions separate us from you. We act as if your commandments do not apply to us and look to ourselves for our own truth. Forgive us, Lord. Where our sin is deep, may your grace abound. Lead us on the path that is following you. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. The assurance of pardon comes from Romans 6, 16 to 18 and 20 through 23. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting in that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Would you bow your heads with me? Almighty God, you are always good. In all seasons, you equip us to your purpose for our lives. In plenty and in famine, you faithfully provide. It is right that we should lay before you a portion of all that we have been blessed with. Please bring us to a right spirit as we give our offerings to you today. Help us to give joyfully and in obedience to your perfect will. May our tithes and offerings, our praises, and our gifts that came from you be pleasing to you. May you bless and multiply these offerings, that they might further your kingdom. Amen.
Our affirmation of faith comes from Philippians chapter 4, 10 to 13. Would you join with me? We rejoice in the Lord greatly. We are speaking not while being in need, for we have learned in whatever situation we are to be content. We know how to be brought low, and we know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, we have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. We can do all things through him who strengthens us. You may be seated. So each week in this month of September, we have had a different affirmation of faith, and uh, lately they have been uh, right out of the Word of God. And I just wonder at times if um, we uh, are uh, hearing what God is saying there. And I, even as I have read this twice now this morning, I think to myself, am I really content uh, in abundance and in need? certainly what we are called to do and be, but it's not always the case. And I don't know about you, but that is um, a challenge. And sometimes it's easier to be content when we're in need than when we have abundance, because abundance sometimes breeds the need for more abundance. And um, sometimes God works that way. In the uh, gospel, Jesus, in the gospel of Matthew, Jesus says uh, when he looks out to the crowds that he sees them harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then in the gospel of John, he says, I am the good shepherd. And so I invite us to remember that truth is um, simple and as foundational as it is. Uh, that Jesus is our good shepherd. So let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you are our shepherd, our very good shepherd, who has laid down his life for the sheep. And thank you that as that good shepherd, uh, we will not want because you provide. If we wander off, you come and find us. If we are hurting, you pick us up and give us comfort. If we are lost, you show us the way. You make us lie down in green pastures where there is peace and calm. You lead us beside the still waters. You restore our souls. You, good shepherd, lead us in paths of righteousness for your sake, where we can walk in obedience and humility, where we can know you are with us. And even though we walk oftentimes through valleys that are deep and dark, even the valley of the shadow of death, we will not fear. We will not fear any evil because you are with us. Your rod, your staff, they bring us comfort to know that you are near and guiding us. You even prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. In the midst of the battle, God, you provide the strength we need to endure and persevere. You anoint our head with oil so that we know your love and presence. Our cups overflow with your grace and your blessing. Surely goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our lives. 
And your promise is that we will dwell in your house, not only today, but forever. God, hear us as we cry out to you in this silent moment with those things that fill our hearts and minds. For you are the good shepherd who hears his sheep. Your promise, Father, is that you are with us. And one of the ways that we know that promise is real is that you have provided the church so that we are not alone. And we find great comfort not only in the fellowship that we have in Christ, but in the privilege we have of joining together and in one voice praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. So this morning we're going to begin to read in Genesis 37. I invite you to turn there. We're going to read some of that and then go to Genesis chapter 50. But as you turn there, let me just sort of 
bring you up to speed on where we are in the story of God. And um, let me also encourage you, friends, if you are not in an adult class, you need to get there next week because there is so much happening that it is impossible to cover uh, even the major themes just in the brief time on Sunday mornings in worship. So that hour of class and education matters. I mean, in fact, think about it. Last week we were talking about Abraham, okay? Abraham. Today we're going to talk about Joseph. That means we've skipped four generations. Abraham had Isaac, who had Jacob, and Jacob's son is Joseph. So we've covered that gamut in two minutes. Um, So you need to go to class in order to keep up with us there. I also want to just sort of preface our reading uh, this morning with two uh, points. One, if you haven't been to class, or maybe even if you have, you haven't heard these terms yet. But as we read about God's story, there are two levels in that story that are often referred to in the curriculum. That is the lower story. That's our day-to-day, daily grind of living the Christian life, of encountering real experiences of what it means to live in the world by faith. That's our lower story, kind of our experiential uh, encounter with what's going on in the present. But then there's the upper story. And the upper story is a different perspective, and that is an overarching view of what God is doing, not just day by day, but in the bigger picture. How God is bringing about His purpose and His plan of salvation and redemption to people. And can you see how sometimes the lower story clouds the upper story a little bit? That we're so present and wrapped up in the circumstance of today that we don't always see the balcony view of how God is at work. Usually we see that when we look back, right? In the last 10 years, here's what God has done to grow me or to move in my family. But in the last 10 hours, it's a little more difficult to have uh, that advantage. So let me encourage you to have both of those views, the lower story and that upper story. And the second point is that we're going to read about Joseph. And at the end of the message, I will repeat this in some form, and that is this. Joseph is a type of Christ. He's a foreshadowing of Jesus. And I say that now because I want you to think through with a lens on as you hear about Joseph, how his life and experience in many, many ways parallels or prepares people for Jesus. Jesus being the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan, the Savior. Joseph being a type of Savior in his life as well. So let me pray for us as we approach the Word of God. Father, thank you for revealing to us your purpose and plan of redemption and salvation and the fulfillment of that in your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Open our minds and our hearts to receive truth and grace this morning that we might see your spirit at work even today in the circumstance and situation that we're in and in the big picture of how you are at work. We pray in Christ's name, amen. So beginning to read in Genesis 37, remember I said Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, then Jacob had 12 sons, 12 sons, hear the word of God. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan, and these are the generations of Jacob. 
Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel, who's another name for Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he, Joseph, was the son of his old age. And he made him, Jacob made Joseph, a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than all his brothers, they hated Joseph and could not speak peacefully to him. Can you read sibling rivalry here? Conflict within the family. Brothers who don't get along. A father who has shown favor to one of the children, particularly Joseph. Verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and my sheaf arose and stood upright, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers. Behold, I have dreamed another dream. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go. See if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, listen to this, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, Here comes that dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard this, he rescued Joseph out of their hands, saying, let's not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. And he said that so that Reuben might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to the father. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of that beautiful robe, that robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Now, don't miss that. These Ishmaelites are on their way to Egypt. Can I just help us again remember the larger upper story? The Israelites eventually end up in Egypt because Joseph is there. Do you remember what happens when the Israelites become too many in Egypt? Pharaoh gets concerned about their number and enslaves them. And then God raises up somebody to deliver them who is 
Moses. But do you see what's happening here in history? The Israelites would never have been in Egypt had Joseph not been sent to Egypt, had the brothers not put him in the pit, had he not been sold to the Ishmaelites. Let's keep uh, reading here. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother, conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother of our own flesh, and his brothers listened to him. The Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up, lifted him up into the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. So let's pause from the reading, and let me just sort of fill in some of the gaps. Joseph is sold to the Ishmaelites. He's taken to Egypt. When in Egypt, he's sold again, this time to Potiphar, kind of the right-hand man of the Pharaoh, with great power. And Joseph becomes a servant in the house of Potiphar. Joseph does so well, and God blesses Joseph in his servanthood that Potiphar makes him the head servant. He has oversight of all the house. He's very popular. However, Mrs. Potiphar also finds him very popular. And she tries to seduce him, and he runs away and says no. But for fear of being found out, she accuses him falsely of pursuing her. That's what she tells her husband. He believes his wife. He throws Joseph into prison. From being the top servant now to being in prison. And in prison, Joseph encounters the Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker. Cupbearer and baker. And they have dreams while they're in prison with Joseph. And Joseph interprets those dreams just as he interpreted the dreams God gave him about his brothers. And those dreams of the baker and the cupbearer come true. One is restored to their position in the court of Pharaoh. The other one is killed by Pharaoh. And Joseph says to the one who's restored, Remember me before the Pharaoh when you go. Hoping that maybe he would be let out of prison. But no, he doesn't remember Joseph until Pharaoh has some dreams. It says, I would like these dreams to be interpreted, but no one seems to be able to do that. Then the fellow prisoner remembers Joseph and says, hey, I know a guy who interpreted my dream, and it came true. Pharaoh sends for Joseph. Joseph comes, listens to the dreams, and interprets them. Do you remember what he says? He says, there will be seven years of great feast. The harvest will be full. There'll be a lot of product and productivity. But following that, there will be seven years of famine. Pharaoh, believing Joseph, appoints him to be the head of the house, the head of his court, and says, do whatever it takes, you are so wise. So Joseph is in charge, and when the harvest is plentiful, He reaps the harvest and he stores the grain for the lean years that are to come. And indeed, those famine years do come. And Egypt is known as the land that has food because of God blessing Joseph with wisdom and position. Back to Joseph's father and brothers. In their land, there was famine also, but they did not have the storage of grain and food. They were starving. And so Joseph's father, Jacob, sends the sons, Joseph's brothers, to Egypt to find grain. And it's there. Why? Because Joseph was there. And God had ordained Joseph to be a means of saving many because of his wisdom, his savvy, 
this political expertise. At first, Joseph's brothers do not recognize him, but he recognizes them. And there are some games that are played between them, and eventually um, Joseph says, bring my other brother and my father and bring them here. And they do. And they realize it's Joseph, and they are fearful because they hated Joseph. They wanted to kill Joseph, and they sold him as a slave. And now here he is in charge with all authority, and they are afraid of vengeance. And might I say, justice. And so they walk on eggshells for a while, but they also know as long as their father is alive, Joseph will be kind to them in order to honor his father because that's the kind of man Joseph is. In chapter 50, at verse 15, this is what happens. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, listen carefully, do not fear For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus, Joseph comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Wow. That's grace. That's mercy. So Joseph says, don't be afraid. What you meant for evil, God has meant for good. And that's the phrase I want to challenge us to think about today. And let me just remind us, Joseph isn't saying that they didn't behave with evil intention. He's acknowledging they did hate him, that there was a wrong that was done. It was unjust, inappropriate, unloving, out of anger and jealousy. Evil exists today, doesn't it? We see it every day in the lower story. People are unkind to one another. They hate people that aren't like themselves. They want vengeance, and really when they cry for justice, what they want is power. They aren't very merciful or forgiving or kind. You may have been a Joseph in that situation when somebody has harmed or hurt you intentionally. And you may perhaps want revenge or seek justice for them. But hear the words of Joseph. Am I in the place of God? We are not in the place of God to take vengeance. God will be the just one and the judge. We need to step back and say, even when evil is happening, 
God intends good. God intends good. So let me read from Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to start with, and then a few more. The Word of God says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Again, there's no denial of suffering. Every one of us suffers in some capacity, some more than others. And this isn't to say that suffering is good. But what the Word of God says consistently is that suffering does not have the final word. Death does not have the final statement. Darkness is overcome with the light of Christ. Evil and darkness that really do exist in our world today do not have authority over God and over the light of Jesus Christ. The light of Jesus Christ pierces through the darkness, overcomes the darkness, defeats evil. In Christ, sin is defeated and put to death. And in Christ's resurrection, the light shines. And God is glorified. So in reality, we face evil all the time. Sometimes, knowingly or unknowingly, we even participate in that evil. But thanks be to God that by His grace, light overcomes the darkness. Mercy rules over vengeance or justice. God will be God We shouldn't try to play God. A few verses later, in that same Romans 8, it says this. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Again, let's not misread this. Everything that happens is not good. There are a lot of bad things that happen to you and to me and to others in our world. It's not denying that evil exists. It's saying that God is sovereign even over evil and can take something bad and bring good out of it. Can take something painful, something that dies and give new life and if I dare say, hope. Hope. And that's what this story of Joseph and understanding of the word of God is saying. Even when bad things happen. I don't know if you've been thrown into a pit lately or put into jail or hated by someone or were in trouble because you told the truth, like Joseph. But he endured. He persevered because God had a purpose, a good purpose, an important purpose for Joseph. God has a good purpose, an important purpose for his people today. Now, let me conclude by reminding us what I said at the beginning. Joseph points us to Jesus. Joseph saved many people through the suffering he endured. Jesus saves many people through the suffering he endured. Joseph was sold as a slave for an amount of money. Jesus was betrayed by Judas for an amount of money. Jesus was thrown into prison unjustly. He had not committed a crime. Joseph 
was thrown into prison unjustly. He was innocent of what he was accused of. God uses Joseph to help us see Jesus and to prepare us for that final, final satisfying and fulfilling Redeemer who is Christ. In Luke 23, verse 34, while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he says this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sometimes people who commit evil acts know exactly what they're doing. Other times they don't. But the response of our Lord in trusting the Father and his plan should inspire us to respond in the same way, with forgiveness and trust, trusting that God can bring good out of evil. God can overcome evil with good. Dare I say that God provided Joseph to Egypt to save the Israelites when there was a famine. And God has provided Jesus to save us when we are hungry and thirsty for God, for what is right and what is good. Beloved, God has good purposes in mind. By his grace, may we endure the poor choices that are made, the evil acts that we encounter, the suffering that is ours or others. May we persevere, not because the circumstances will get better, but because we know that God has a good intention and a good plan. We see that most definitely in Jesus. Let's pray together. God, we see evil in the world. We see suffering. We know there's injustice. And yet we choose to believe and trust you because you have revealed to us that you will redeem all things through Christ. That good overcomes evil that you have pierced the darkness with the light of Christ, that you have overcome that which is wrong with that which is right. May we endure and trust that you will be glorified and we will share in that glory one day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn. In number 426.
So friends, I don't know uh, what your week holds before you. I hope you don't get thrown into a pit. I hope you uh, don't end up in jail or are falsely accused of something you haven't done. But you know what? It could happen. And it does happen. But remember that wherever you're going, you're not going alone. And no matter how wrong it might be, God is still sovereign over it. Endure in that place. Persevere when something bad is happening. Knowing that God has good intentions and purposes and can redeem and reconcile you and that circumstance. And always remember that nothing separates you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Not your greatest loss or greatest fear. God's love is greater. His light overcomes that darkness. May the grace of God that we know in the gift of Jesus, the ultimate deliverer, the Savior, his life, death, resurrection, his return, that is our hope, and he is our salvation. So may the Holy Spirit so fill you with courage and humility that you will depend upon Christ no matter what you have or don't have today or tomorrow. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.